This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and Discord servers, on-screen shout outs, and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. All right, so what I want to do in this video is talk about the losers, right? Whenever you bring in a bunch of players, there's inevitably going to be people who do not benefit from this influx of new players being brought in. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the people who are losing in this situation. And look, the good news for Browns fans is that this year, the losers are not as spicy. It ain't really been that spicy for a while, but it's not as spicy. And that's a good thing. Let me tell you why that's a good thing. When we go on here and we do a losers video and it's full of a bunch of dudes you drafted in the third and second round and the first round of a couple years ago that tells me that we are in a constant state of roster turnover. When I do this video and I got to scratch my head to figure out who's going to be in this video and I can basically only come up with like five scenarios where somebody might negatively be affected. It's a good thing. Now, why is this the case? Why are there not going to be a ton of people that populate this list outside of what I've already mentioned? Well, this year's draft class is a little unique. It's the smallest draft class in NFL history, and I feel like it's the oldest draft class in NFL history. We've all seen the memes where Andrew Barry is basically Leonardo DiCaprio. He likes his draft picks at maximum about 23 and a half years old, right? Like, and there's a bunch of 24 year olds in this year's draft class. And really he like them like under 22. So not a ton of people for the Browns to pick here. They did make six selections. I think two are locks to make the roster. I think the other two are pretty strong uh, chance to make the roster in Jamari Thrash and, and Nathaniel Watson. Like they'll make the roster more than likely. I'm pretty confident they will, but since there's not a ton of people coming in to take a ton of jobs, there's not a ton of turnover, the roster's pretty much set for the Browns, and it's been set even before the draft. There's not a ton of people losing, but I do think there's some interesting things to say about the people who are losing in this conversation. So let's just jump into it. So on the offensive side of the ball, I think the losers are Joe Batonio, Wyatt Teller. Joe Batonio, not really. Wyatt Teller, maybe. Joe Batonio is not a loser in this situation because Joe Batonio will play for the Cleveland Browns as long as Joe Batonio wants to play for the Cleveland Browns. There is no scenario where somebody pushes Joe Batonio out of a spot. There's a scenario where Joe Batonio retires and then his spot becomes available, but there's no real scenario where Zach Zinter, like, puts the Browns in this situation where they force Joe Batoni out, or at least that's not fathomable. Faf that's not something I can fathom right now. Like maybe in a couple years, if he makes an incredible leap, we get there. But Joe Batonio is a borderline hall of fame player. That dude chooses when he gets to leave like that. That's one of them ones that gets to choose that. Um, Wyatt Teller, on the other hand, is not at that level, but he's still at a very high level of player. Um, and it, it's a question of how things go with the team that really dictate what's going to happen next with Wyatt Teller. If the Browns have a successful season next year, and let's say it's real successful, let's say they get close to a championship or win a championship, then Wyatt Teller, they're going to deal with that contract. They don't care, right? They're going to run it back. Um but let's say this season is like horribly disappointing and it's obvious you just need to rebuild and re-scrap, which I don't think is super likely. But if that happens, then all of a sudden things like Wyatt Teller's situation comes up or if Wyatt Teller has a bad season, right? His spot could become in jeopardy um, as far as the Browns not wanting to pay what they're paying him. 
um, for the level of play that he is giving them. Now, he's not there yet. He's still a really good player, but that's just a possible scenario that can happen. Um, in the future, the Browns are going to want to get cheaper on the offensive line, right? Like they want to they're right now. I think they're paying the most money that any team is paying for an offensive line because they have kept literally everybody on that offensive line this is why i think a jet wheels extension unless it comes at a very cheap price is not super likely because the browns have to get out of this second contract situation with their off they got the exact opposite problem that they've had with defensive tackle right where a defensive tackle they can't find somebody to give a second contract to offensive line they can't stop giving out new contracts to these dudes and it's because they're really good players but that makes that line expensive. It's not sustainable to pay that much money for your offensive line. You're going to find a, have to find a way to get cheaper within the next few years. That's where Zach Zinter figures in, and that's where Wyatt Teller figures out um, in that conversation. The other losers on the offensive side of the ball, David Bell, Michael Woods, Jamari Thrash is likely going to take a roster spot, and that means David Bell or Michael Woods' spot is probably expendable. You keep in mind that the Browns signed Naheem Hines to return kicks. They also brought in James Prochet to return kicks. And if those two are their kick returners and there's not that much competition at that spot and the Browns aren't pitting them against each other, right? The Browns are saying, this is the kick returner. This is the pump returner type situation. Then that's the spot, right? So yeah, I don't see both of those guys making the roster right now because if you look at it, Amari Cooper, Locke, Jerry Judy, Locke, um, Cedric Tillman, Locke, Elijah Moore, Locke. So it's four locks. Um, maybe James Prochet if he's returning kicks. David Bell's not going to start returning kicks and punts anytime soon. So where's he going to get his snaps in? Had a good end to last year, but where's the utility going to come from? He's already competing with Jamari Thrash. Jamari Thrash is a wide receiver who I think kind of operates in his lane. Um, and when it comes to Michael Woods, he's been injured so much that I don't know where the team is still at on him. At one point, they thought highly of him, but two injuries later, I don't know where they're at. Um, and then the last loser is on defense, Siaki Ika. I don't want to dogpile on Siaki Ika because I feel like that is going on right now. And to be fair to Siaki Ika, it's not like he's played a ton. And my issue isn't with Siaki Ika. It's with the process that brought us him because we are two years into this. And this is the one draft pick that they've made in four years where I don't understand what the plan is. Usually with Kevin and AB, there's a plan. There's a very obvious plan. I don't know what the plan is for Siaki Ika. Like maybe you could have convinced me the day he was drafted that this was the long-term play to replace Dalvin Thompson when his contract comes up. But nothing that has happened since draft day suggests to me that that is the path. Nothing that's happened since draft day suggests to me that there even is a path with Siaki Ika. Like, what is it that they want him to do? He's a 360-pound guy. He's a one-tech naturally he has short arms, but he's he, he looks like a one tech, right? A nose, nose tackle for those who don't mess with the new lingo going out there. So he's a nose tackle. He's a one tech. He's a zero. Like that. That's what he is. Then you get on the phone with him when you draft him, and you say, "Hey, we're gonna turn a dump trunk into a Ferrari." So in my mind, I'm thinking. They about to make this man lose weight so he can play 3T? Well, that don't make sense because none of his tapes suggested to me that he would be good at any of that shit. So that didn't make sense. The season starts. He's not active in a single game that matters. 
Like, maybe there was one game where we got, like, 45 injuries. But, like, literally, if the Browns had a choice, they put this man in sweats and kept him in sweats the whole year. Even when they had issues in the run game. Even when there were times where you could say to yourself, man, they could use a nose tackle. They're not. They're getting ran on a little bit up the middle. Never activated him for a situation like that. Never. Not once. So he's not nose. When he gets in the game, he plays as a three. Who's he replacing? Was he was he there? To replace Jordan Elliott, right? That was another question. Maybe he's there to replace Jordan Elliott. Jordan Elliott's contract was coming up. You get to Jordan Elliott's contract. And the Browns bring in Quentin Jefferson to replace uh, Jordan Elliott. So, again, I ask, what is the plan with Siaki Iga? Now, one draft pick. It's the one draft pick in four years where I just don't know what the answer is to that. I don't get it. I don't get it. But the Browns not only drafted Michael Hall, who like even further clouds this whole thing because of Quentin Jefferson is in to replace Jordan Elliott or at least to move people up or down the totem pole to get Jordan Elliott replaced. And Michael Hall is there to eventually be a starter. Who is Siaki Ika supposed to be there for? I don't know, man. Does he get cut? It's hard for me to see him make this roster because right now, how many defensive tackles? you? It's the least versatile, well, not the least versatile position. Well, let me check that. Is that the least? Corner, definitely more versatile. Um, linebacker, definitely more versatile. Safety, definitely more versatile. Edge, more versatile than defensive tackle. Um yeah, it's one of the least versatile positions on the team because you don't play like special teams as a defensive tackle. You could be like a lighter edge and still play special. So, yeah, like literally if you're a defensive tackle, you have to play defensive tackle. Like there's nowhere else to hide you. on. It's not a position where you can carry an excess, right? You can carry an excess of what you would normally carry of wide receivers, of running backs, of linebackers, of defensive backs because – there are a lot of roles on special teams for those kind of players. There's one role on the football team for a defensive tackle, and that is to play defensive tackle. So you don't think he's going to be able to get active minutes because you're telling me right now the rotation is Maurice Hurst, the rotation is Michael Hall, the rotation is, and this is not in any particular order, Dalvin Tomlinson, the rotation is Quentin Jefferson, the rotation is Alex Wright. We don't forgot about Alex Wright. Like he still plays power edge. So Alex Wright is still in that kind of rotation there at defensive tackle. I feel like I'm forgetting names because there's so many of them, but that's what I mean. There's like six of these dudes. You only supposed to keep like five. And that doesn't even include the fact that they drafted one more defensive tackle in the seventh round that might make the team. I don't think he's going to make the team, but he might make the team. And again, it asks me, I, I ask this question, like, what is the role for Siaki Ika? What's my man about to do? Because I'm confused. I'm confused. I don't see it. Um, but yeah, Siaki Ika, he's in a tough spot. I don't think the Browns can get away with having him rostered and just having him inactive because the roster did get better this year. You are deeper. You have more players. I think he is going to have to find his way to that practice squad if that's possible. Maybe you do a long play thing like you did with K York where you cut him, somebody else picks him up, but eventually you get your man's back. But I think that that's the plan. But even if we do that, what are we grooming him for? I don't understand. 
Like, I, I would love to know what the plan is for Siaki. Like, what what did they pitch that he was going to be doing in Cleveland? Because I know they give these pitches out to these players when they draft them. Hey, man, this is what our path is for you. We see you doing this, this, and this eventually. But right now, this is what you're going to do. What was that for Siaki Ika? He feels like the only player they've drafted in four years where you can't tell if, if there's a plan. And he's like a day two pick, right? He's a third round pick. Like this is very unusual for the Browns in general. It's super unusual for a day two pick. But that's my thoughts on the losers of the Browns draft. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Y'all have a great day. Happy better night. Peace.